Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the chairman of Financo, Gilbert Harrison, for an interview with the group CEO of Dixon's Carphone, Sebastian James. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us after what we hope was a very enjoyable and fruitful lunch. And By the way, I'm incredibly grateful to the Shop Talk cartoonist who's made me look about 25 years younger, so I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And ask my wife. She doesn't recognize me, <laughs> but that's beside the point. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce you to you, uh, Sebastian James, somebody that I've known for over 30 years. Um, Sebastian... I first met... Uh, my, my dad, I remember my dad saying to me a few, about 25 years ago, he said, uh, oh, I've known him all my life, I've known him 30 years, and I remember thinking, nobody is that old. Uh, I'm afraid that's us now. <laughs> well, that happened to me just yesterday. <laughs> Facebook sent me a cartoon, uh, a thing saying, uh, you've known your uh, Teddy Kaplan, who's my grandson, for four years, and I, he's, since he's 19 years old, I saw him when he was, <laughs> I knew him when he was born. Anyway, Sebastian, as you probably know, is the group chief executive of Dixon's Carf Home Warehouse, and he has done an absolutely amazing job in transforming his business into what it is today um, between building an electronics business that is uh, the dominant leader in uh, the UK and uh, throughout other places in Europe, as well as buying Carf Home Warehouse, uh, which were merged together to create a gigantic company. Um, Seb, since you joined Dixon's, um, you've led this into the new world. Um, tell us a little bit about your insider's view of the challenges that you've had, what are the biggest issues, um, and what's your sense of evolution as the business transforms itself? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of questions there. I, I think, um, I mean, the first thing is when, I mean, I joined about 10 years ago, and uh, at that time, we were in a perfect storm. I think like a lot of big box retailers, uh, the company enjoyed a lot of success. I think it then had a period when it went through a period of hubris and started buying overseas businesses, uh, which were loss-making and structurally unsound, uh, and then began to underinvest in the UK business. And by the time I joined, it was really very poor. I mean, our service was uh, the, the, the butt of stand-up comedians' jokes. Uh, our stores looked terrible. And at the same time, we had this perfect storm coming, which was uh, Amazon uh, and other pure players, but principally Amazon entering the market with a very different model and a completely different price point. So that was the sort of picture, if you like, of a lot of UK big box retail uh, about a decade ago. And uh, I think that um, the, the critical thing, crit critical existential problem that we had to face was what is the role of the omnichannel retailer of the store-based and uh, online-based mixed proposition, mixed channel proposition in today's world? Does it have a place? Because, um, and of course, you know, a bit like a belief in God, you have to believe that it does have a place, otherwise you, uh, you, you, know, you, you despair. So that was the biggest existential challenge. But, um, you know, let's skip ahead, though, for a second, and let's talk about your share of the UK market and Amazon, since you brought it up. Um, you have, uh, in, uh, in, in your e-commerce business, about a 25% share of the UK uh, market. 27, yeah. 27. And Amazon, I mean, you're, you're three times higher than Amazon, which only yes. has an 8% share. Yes, I mean, my feeling on Amazon is that, you know, uh, after 21 years with this uh, apparently revolutionary and, and fantastic and completely different and much better business model, I think to have achieved 8% is not bad, uh, but it's not that great. <laughs> <laughs> And how do you achieve your great success in terms of uh, uh, doing what you've been doing? So I think, I, I think in, well, we, we've thought, we think a lot about uh, Amazon, as, as you can imagine. Um, and uh, and I, there are a couple of things I, I, I raised here. The first one is, in thinking about Amazon, we started out by, by, by asking ourselves the question, well, what are we better at? It's easy to get mesmerized, you know, like a, like a mongoose and a snake. You know, it's easy to get mesmerized by... Uh, a new entrant that's coming in that appears so fresh and so shiny and seems to have so many advantages and lower costs and that kind of thing. And we, we really started thinking about where do we have structural advantages that we could exploit? And it turns out there are some, which, is, which I was obviously, for, I for one was quite relieved about. And, and the, the first of those is that we have 150 million face-to-face -face conversations with customers every single day. And that allows us to do two things that Amazon can't. Uh, and the first is we are massively better at upsell. 
So if you imagine you want to buy a TV, you'll research online, you'll come into our stores, you'll have a picture of what you want on your phone. We will say to you, listen, we will sell you that TV at that price, but let, before you do that, let me just quickly show you the 4K version or the OLED version or the better version. And we find that uh, in 52% of cases, people will trade up at least one notch from where they were before. And the end-to-end the -end supplier economics of that are such that we get rewarded explicitly for that work. Now, so are that's you doing first. this by phone, by internet, uh, No, no, face-to-face, face-to-face. Uh, -face. So the key is n n um, almost 90% of customers buying a TV or a refrigerator or a, a computer will spend um, part of that journey in a store, which is a completely rational thing to do. And we say, okay, you came to see us. Now our job here is to get access to sources of revenue that are not available to our pure play competition. And one of them is upsell. The other one is cross-sell. Uh, we are seven to 10 times more effective than Amazon at uh, cross-selling, selling other goods and services. So for instance, you made your choice of a TV. I want to buy this big, beautiful OLED TV, and that's a great thing to buy. We will say, okay, let's play a movie on that TV, and now let's plug in a sound bar and play the movie again. And we find, again, in, uh, in, in the case of TVs, in 40% of cases, people will buy the sound bar with it. And by the way, when they do, the NPS is higher. So it's a kind of win-win all round and gives us access to sources of revenue, which together, actually leave us structurally advantaged relative to our pure play uh, competition. So and that, that and warranties, how do they play into the game? So warranties, I think, is, uh, no, it's, warranties is, the, is one of the services that we sell uh, along with installation um, and delivery, setup, uh, training, and a whole bunch of other things that we do uh, to help customers uh, and, and is one of the cross-sells that, that, that we do. So, um, uh, so, so that was very interesting. We then, that means that you focus your whole business on the conversation, the quality of that conversation, the upsell, the cross-sell that you do uh, for uh, the customer. And, and what we found is that that helps us to not only um, uh, compete with Amazon, but also uh, it, managed, it helped us to kill off our competition, which is, which is great because um, I know it sounds a bit unkind, but I really like my competition dead. You should, <laughs> you're achieving I, I, it. <laughs> um, uh, Stanley Combs, our, our founder, uh, who founded Dixon's uh, um, uh, 100 years ago, or whatever it is, he said to me, um, we, 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 he was, he's a mentor and president of the company, and he said to me one day, uh, I remember saying to him, we had a local competitor called Comet, and I said to him when I was quite early in my tenure here, Stanley, I feel really bad, but I really hate Comet. And he patted me on the head, he patted me on the head like a little boy, and he said, um, my boy, he said, you should hate your competitors and dream of their death. <laughs> <laughs> so a lesson word from the, learned from the wiser. Yeah. Um, uh, tell me, uh, we, in the U US, we call it click and collect. Yeah. Um, what are you doing in the UK? And does that enhance and add on additional sales when the customer comes in? Uh, yes, so we do, we do a thing called click and collect in the UK as well. And, um, and uh, it's much the same model. Uh, we, we, we think, uh, it's an interesting, we're just having this debate right now, actually. We, we used to be quite um, forward. When customers came in to buy something they bought online, uh, we would be pretty active in trying to upsell and cross-sell as if they'd come in in the first place. And actually, what we're finding is that customers are telling us they don't really like that. Uh, if they've clicked and collected, they just want to show up, get their goods and go. So we need to find the balance there. And I think the right answer is going to be in something that I've never seen anybody do yet, but we really want to do, uh, which is true pause and resume shopping. So what, what I'd like to see happen is you start your research online. And for our products, by the way, uh, the average is 90 days before you buy it, you start your research. So these are really long, considered purchases. And the, 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 the research that you do online with us, we can carry that research into the store so that when you meet a colleague, um, that colleague can pick up and say, well, listen, I noticed you looked at these products. Uh, let me show them to you. Uh, let me talk to you about other products. And similarly, the, the, the contents of that conversation are, are then played back when the customer goes home to talk about it with their partner or their kids or whatever it is at home. So, so I, I like this notion of pause and resume shopping so that we can get the benefit of the conversation even if the customer ends up uh, clicking, collecting, or shopping online. Um, you've developed some new technological strategies like Honeybee and so on. Do you want to discuss that at all? Uh, yes, I mean, Honeybee is, 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 our, is our, um, our attempt to be a, a, a venture player, and I'm not sure we're anything more than gifted amateurs at best at it, but we developed a piece of software in our stores um, that allowed people to, buy, to, to, to navigate the 45,000 different tariff handset combinations. And uh, so that the customer, you know, when you go into a phone shop, uh, but a phone is a very boring object until it's connected. At the moment it becomes connected, it's, it's a, a very interesting object. And our software reduced the time it took to walk out with a working phone from 45 minutes to 12 minutes. 
And you can imagine that productivity increase allows us to spend much more time talking about accessories um, and also gives the time, the customer more time, you know, with their kids, say. Um, let's change this a little bit and uh, talk about something uh, that you really haven't been happy about. And that is uh, recently um, you announced in one of your earnings releases that your phone sales have dropped. Yeah. And uh, even though your business has been remained extremely strong, especially electronics business. Uh, can you talk a, a little bit about that? I know you're not happy about it, but... No, um, I mean, we... we um, so the phone business in, in the UK is a bit peculiar because for, for two reasons. Firstly, we really only have two players. One is Apple and one is Samsung. And together, they represent more than 90% of the, the overall market. So it's a very significant market. Secondly, um, it is a, a post-pay market where the vast bulk of customers buy uh, a phone and a, uh, and a contract at the same time. So those two things are interesting. We also did what, in my view, was an extraordinarily stupid thing, which was we decided to leave the European Union uh, earlier last year. <laughs> I was and, coming to that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, um, <laughs> I, I was campaigning very passionately against it, and I'm totally lost. So I apologize for that to everybody here. But the the um, so the, we so Seb told me earlier that we could spend the entire 20 minutes talking about yeah, that. and more. So. And I, I've got all afternoon. I don't know. Um, so. Uh, so, um, and that resulted in a couple of immediate things. The first one is my stock price halved. And secondly, and that's the less important one, the more important one is that we had a currency deflation of about 18%, and that flowed straight through to phones, of course, to particularly to the latest phone. It's the one you can't compare with anything else. So, um, as a result, m many more customers decided, well, you know what, I've come to the end of my contract, my phone is still working, I'm going to hang on to it and I'm going to buy a SIM to put in it. Um, and the refresh cycle on phone has gone from a just under 24 months to just over 28 months, which is a big hole in our market. And that, that's been quite painful. Um, it's affected, I think, everybody, uh, but it, is, um, it, it does, it does you know, cause us some uh, some discomfort for a, you know, for a free year. But on a positive note, talk about the way the electronic sales have really just continued to yeah, grow. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're delighted by uh, the resilience that we've seen in consumers in this space. And we, we, you know, we, we currently have a 27% UK market share. Um, and, uh, so, and we are very strong and we are continuing to gain share. And I think even in markets that are relatively flat, therefore we're able to be quite successful uh, in terms of growing our like for likes. I mean, as we all know, you know retail like for likes tend to be quite low single digit growth and we're, we're pleased to see them. Well, we talked a few minutes ago about the uh, iPhone and the Samsung phones that were just announced and uh, being them priced at over a thousand pounds and you talked about the consumers being concerned about it. But uh, let's talk a little bit about generation X, Y, and Z and how these new consumers view both electronic and the phone sectors and how are you catering to these new people? Yes, I, I mean, I think uh, each generation, I think, uh, finds themselves bewildered by the next generation and, by the way, by the one before. Uh, I think in the end, though, human values subsist. Uh, we tend to meet, um, we tend to meet uh, phone customers very young. Uh, the first phone that most people get is around 11, and by the way, that's getting younger. So um, uh, I think we, we will expect to see over the next few years that eight is the normal age at which people will begin to have their first smartphone. Uh, and so you know, getting to understand what drives those customers, what drives their parents is very important. But by and large, we meet customers when they set up a home, you know, when they buy a refrigerator, when they buy a... Uh, so these are, tend to be more mature customers, um, you know, typically on the employment ladder, uh, and, and their needs and requirements, uh, although they become much more sophisticated in terms of channel, much less forgiving in terms of service, uh, and much, of course, absolutely brutal in terms of price comparison, um, by and large, their needs are the same. They want great products, they want to be sure they're at great prices, and they want to be served them in a way which is neither patronizing uh, nor, uh, nor um, incompetent. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, um, while you're catering to, forget about the eight-year-olds because they probably come in with their parents. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you're so proud of is the service you give. So that as you give service to the younger consumers, how does that build up loyalty so that when they do buy a, a home or whatever and they need to buy refrigerators and televisions and so on, uh, they know to come to you? I think we're really bad at this. Um, I, 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 um, I think we're really bad at this. I think we, we have an opportunity to be much clearer with the customers that we meet for the first time about what the benefit of being a lifetime uh, a lifetime customer of ours will be. And I think we've just started down that journey. I think other people are ahead of us uh, on this. 
um, we, we, tend, we have tended to regard ourselves as being really good transaction, uh, transaction retailers, uh, both online and offline. Um, you know, we think if you want a TV, if you suddenly wake up with an urge to buy a TV, we're a fantastic place to go to do that. Um, we have not yet begun to build the kind of long-term relationship where we not only uh, sell you the TV, but we keep it working. I, you know, one of the things I always tell my teams is that nobody comes in for a washing machine. Nobody wants to own a washing machine. It is the world's most boring object. But, uh, but what we really want is clean clothes. And, uh, and I think if we can start to begin to get to the use cases and really understand that in the long run for our customers forever, that's going to be make us unassailable by uh, pure play retail. But, so maybe but it's a long journey. Buy, maybe you should buy a dry cleaner. Um, <laughs> maybe we should. Maybe we should. I, when, when, when you, I look forward to talking to my board about that. Um, when, you, um, when, when you look back, though, uh, the Apple phone uh, came to the market, what, 10 years ago? Yes. And um, the, the amount of change that's going on elect the last 10 years has just been amazing. Yes. If you had a look into a crystal ball, and I know in January when the electronics show comes up and you'll be seeing new things, um, uh, it's going to be exciting. But as you talk to your vendors and you see what's on the horizon, what do you see the future being hold for uh, your business? Well, I think, I mean, just looking for it's hard to see what 10 years looks like, but if we look at two, three years, um, I think we're going to see an extraordinary rise, continued rise in this notion of ambient computing, this idea of in every room, uh, there is a, you know, there is a device that will respond to your spoken command. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, I have an Amazon Echo. Just out of interest, could you just put your hand up if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home or something of like that? You know, pretty, so what are we talking about? 10% penetration at the moment. I think that'll be 100%. And by, and by the way, I think you, most people will have one in every room. I, I don't know what, how creepy you think it is that Amazon is listening to what's happening in every room in your house, but, um, uh, but, um, but I think that that is going to be a real thing. I think the Is there a privacy the problem with them? I, I, no, at the moment, I think it's uh, everybody is. Uh, no, we, we are entering a world now, particularly with the millennial generation, where we sacrifice privacy for convenience, and I think that's okay. But the, the, uh, you know, if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home in, in every room, um, then we are going to start discovering, as we did with a smartphone, an extraordinary community of people who come up with fascinating use cases for that. At the moment, I use it only for telling me a joke, and they're not that good. So, um, so um, uh, that's but, why I haven't heard a joke from him the same. No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but but, but the, no, there are relatively few use cases that that make um, that make real sense today. But like the smartphone, that was true. You know, when we first got our first iPhones. Now we can't imagine living without it because of the millions, the extraordinary human ingenuity that's come to be brought to bear on that uh, since then. So that's going to be a big thing. We think VR and AR will be a big thing, but we're a long way from home at the moment. So um, the technology around augmented reality that is nearly ready is absolutely extraordinary. And I've seen some of it um, you know, where you are, you know, where you can hold an, an elephant in your hand and when you let go, it drops. And you know, these things are extraordinarily difficult to do technically. At the moment, you have to keep your head still, which obviously makes it less uh, effective. Uh, but, um, but there's something in there that's going to be qu quite extraordinary, I think. Um, and, then, and, then there's, and then it's hard to see where this e-gaming thing is going. It seems to be absolutely gigantic. And it may be that the whole of our lives become, in some ways, a, a kind of, a kind of um, game. Uh, I, I, it, so these, thing, these look like interesting um, t um, thoughts. Um, tell us the difference, though, between uh, the two different devices. And at the same time, talk a minute about the difference between the Apple uh, and the Samsung phones. Uh, okay, I have to inside, be really careful inside, because I'm definitely going to piss off somebody. So, um, but the uh, so so I think they're both great devices, and uh, we enjoy working <laughs> with both companies very much. So, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I knew he'd say that. <laughs> um, I, no, I, I, so, I I, um, I, 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 I I carry a Samsung S8. I think it's a great great phone. I think the Note 8 is a great device. Um, Apple make very beautiful products. Uh, they make a very addictive operating system. I think this year they've done a, a quite unusual thing, which is split their iPhone launch into two. None of us have really seen the, the iPhone 10. I hope it's going to be terrific. Um, but why generally do you think, speaking... Why do you think, I mean, the iPhone 8, as I understand it, has not been a roaring success. Why do you think they did that as opposed to just keeping the seven and moving to the 10, which is... I think it's quite difficult sometimes to get into the head of Apple, um, and, uh, and sometimes I'm grateful for that. So, um, so uh, uh, no, I, I, th I think that uh, the iPhone 10 is going to be a very popular device. It's extremely expensive. Um, and uh, I was with Apple, and, and one, of the, one of their teams said to me, you know, every wealthy person on the planet is going to want one of these, and I think that's a, a good analysis. I think it's a good, good piece of kit. Um, I think with Samsung, but with all phones, 
we are now reaching a point where the, where the technological innovation is quite incremental year on year and the cost increases are quite substantial and therefore I think it is rational that people are you know, holding onto their phones for longer and I expect that to continue. I think this has been uh, an exciting time for you. There's going to be a lot of changes. Uh, do you want to end up with some predictions for the next year? No, I hope we're going to have a good year. You know, like every retailer, you pray for Christmas. And if any of you are here living in Copenhagen, please go to El Giganten, which is one of ours. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Seb.